Hey y'all, it's Liz. Welcome back to my channel. As you've noticed, my format has changed just a bit. This may not be a permanent thing, but for now it seems to work for me since I'm still learning about video editing. That said, so Henry James, yo. This week I read his novella, The Turn of the Screw, and let me tell you, there are layers upon layers to pull back, so let's get into it. Before we do, if you would like and subscribe, that would be lovely. And as always, feel free to visit me over on my Instagram to get a peek into my life behind all the books. If nothing else, you'll get to see Gracie in action as she helps me open packages on New Book Day. So as any of you who have been hanging out with me for a little bit on either this platform or any of my other social media platforms know, I'm currently recovering from academic burnout. So this channel was meant to help me learn how to read for pleasure again, but I'm finding that separating the academic side of myself from the pleasure reader is impossible, so I'm just going to lean into it. That said, this might get a little heavy for a few folks, but I'm going to try to keep things in perspective and not go overboard with the nerdiness on my part. I am also going to lean into the part of me that is an instructor of English and writing and offer you a few ideas for further research and writing on the layers that exist within James's work, The Turn of the Screw. Let's go. As anyone who's ever read Henry James before knows, there's kind of no way to get around the use of psychoanalytic literary theory when looking at him and his works. For instance, his famous novella, The Beast in the Jungle, includes four elements from Freudian concepts. These concepts include the uncanny, narcissism, the ego, and the mirror stage. In this particular work, the protagonist, Marcher, is a narcissist, and that could be viewed as a part of James himself and his id or superego. Likewise, the uncanny, or plainly put, the idea that something that has occurred in your previous life can come back to haunt you later, is also present in the work. But we're not here to talk about Beast in the Jungle this week. This week I read his novella, The Turn of the Screw. The four Freudian elements of the uncanny, narcissism, ego, and the mirror stage are also present in this work, especially when you look at the character of Miles. Miles seems innocent enough in the beginning, but he turns out to be quite the little narcissistic, ego-driven brat as the story unfolds. If you know anything about James, then you know that he too could be a bit of a narcissist, driven by ego at times. According to Freud, these would be connected to the mirror stage. While diving into the mirror stage would prove to be a fascinating endeavor using James and his work, the uncanny is the most obvious Freudian concept that's found in both The Turn of the Screw and The Beast in the Jungle. It's possible that the use of the uncanny in both of these could be owing to the death of his dear friend Constance Fenimore Wilson in 1894. Wilson's death left a lasting scar on James, and this is reflected in his later works. Although it was claimed that she accidentally fell out of the window while living in Venice, James always believed that it was a suicide. The question is, what would make him so convinced of this that four years after her death, he would be found in the middle of a Venetian lagoon in the dead of night trying to drown her dresses? Are the turn of the screw and the beast in the jungle attempts made by James to make amends for something that he might have done to her? Could it be his review of her work in Harper's coupled with private criticism that drove Wilson to take her life? Or was it just an accident that left James with extreme guilt for the rest of his? I smell a paper or two in there for anyone eager enough to dive into that research. So now let's move away from Freud and his concepts for a while and just look at the story. The story begins with a Christmas party and ghost stories being told around the fire in the parlor. This was typical for Victorian households who did not reserve ghost stories for late October, but instead wove them into their Christmas traditions. This is a tradition that really begins in earnest with Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol, which was published in 1843. Incidentally, this is the same year that James was born. James thus grew up in the shadow of Dickens, and this is reflected in his writing style, which comes across as forced with a lack of clarity on occasion for the modern day reader. The way that James plays with the reader's sense of time is also indicative of how Dickens played with time and space in A Christmas Carol. This can be seen most clearly in the first few pages of The Turn of the Screw, which gives the reader the same sense that one might experience when watching Leonardo DiCaprio's films Inception or Shutter Island. Once again, there seems to be a paper in there for anyone brave enough to jump into it. 
Now let's look at the characters. The typical reader of The Turn of the Screw finds that these consist of Douglas, who is in possession of a written form of the story, an uncle that we meet briefly in the beginning, the protagonist of the new governess who's never given a proper name, Miles and Flora, who are the charges of this governess, Mr. Quint and Miss Jessel, who are the ghosts of the previous valet and the previous governess at Bly Manor, Mrs. Gross, who's the housekeeper, and Luke, who is the manservant there. Many readers do not consider the house itself to be a character, but overlooking Bly Manor as a character in and of itself would be a mistake. In fact, Dickens and many other Victorian-era authors often made the spaces that their characters occupied central to understanding the story as a whole. One has only to look at Emily Bronte's novel, Wuthering Heights, to see how spaces such as the heights and the grains imply things about their inhabitants, for instance. When looking at Bly, then, the new governess admits that at first she saw it as a place of romance inhabited by a sprite. The governess then declares that looking back, this view is contracted, faded, and washed of color. This is a hint that the experiences that she lived through there would dim the light that she once saw in the house and its inhabitants because the house is haunted. But James's use of words here implies that the house holds only what the inhabitants bring to it, and therefore it reflects back their pain, their joy, their love, their lust, and their agony. The house is therefore alive, and it absorbs the emotions and the experiences of the people who occupy the spaces there. When Bly Manor is considered as a character, the possibility is raised that it is meant to stand for the work that was undertook by A1 Nellie Bly, who was an investigative journalist in New York in the late 1800s. She actually had herself committed to Blackwell Asylum in New York City in 1887 as part of her investigative journalist work. Since it was not unusual for some Victorian authors to visit asylums as part of their research, it is entirely possible that James would have been aware of the expose that Nellie Bly, a.k.a. Elizabeth Jane Cochran, published in the New York World regarding her discoveries at Blackwell. This expose laid bare the horrific conditions in the New York City asylum system, and it would eventually force changes therein. Cochran actually took her pen name from a Stephen Foster song that was popular at the time. This could mean that James simply took the name for his manor house from the same song, or it could mean that he took the name for his manor house as a way of secretly expressing the madness that could be found within, which mirrors the madness that Bly found at Blackwell Asylum. One last possibility for hidden Easter eggs can be found if we return to the psychoanalytic lens. Through this lens, it's entirely possible that Miles is meant to stand for James himself and the governors could be Woolston, since there was a small age gap between them and one seemed to worship the other as Miles adores the governess. All of these are again worthy topics for research and writing. So now let's pull back and just look at the story. In the beginning of the novella, a character named Douglas is recounting the events taken down by the governess, who will become the protagonist as the narrative unfolds. As the governess takes over the telling of the story, we discover that the uncle has been left as a provider for children when he inherited the estate, and he makes it clear that he's not to be bothered by the governess when it comes to the care and upbringing of Miles and Flora. This presents a problem immediately for the unnamed governess because when she arrives at Bly, she's confronted with a letter from the headmaster of Miles' school informing her that Miles has been ejected from the institution for being, quote, an injury to others, end quote. What the injury is that he has caused is revealed in the final pages of the novella, and it seems to bring up issues of sexuality that have been brewing under the surface it has been suggested that the two ghosts represent the repressed sexuality of the characters of the governess and Miles in The Turn of the Screw. As most people know, it wasn't that Victorians weren't having sex or even kinky sex at that. It's more to the point to say that publicly all sexuality was repressed. In fact, many of the sexual orientations and expressions of sexuality that we have no problem with today would have made you a pariah in Victorian times if you so much as whispered them to the wrong person. Given the way that Victorians felt publicly about sex and sexuality, then it makes perfect sense that the governess refers to Mrs. Jezel as her, quote, vile predecessor, and Quint is understood to be one of the same consonants by all that ever knew him. In fact, Miss Gross makes it clear to the new governess that Quint took liberties with anyone and everyone at his leisure. For this reason, no one in the household, or even the reader, feels bad when they find out that Quint was found dead by a, a laborer after seemingly having gotten drunk and taken a fall. This is merely seen as his comeuppance. Did Quint fall though, or was he pushed? The same could be asked when speaking of Wilson's death. Here again, the uncanny seems to be pushing its way through James's work and makes for perfect fodder if you're looking to write a paper.
So where does this leave us? Given that Quint was left to his own devices with the children when their uncle left Bly, the assumption has been made by many critics that Quint molested the two children and pulled Miss Jessel into the indulgences along the way. This seems too simple to me, though. As I read it, it seemed to me that the new governess was struggling with her own identity and sexuality, as any 20-year-old would, and that Miss Jessel represented the sexual side of her that she was trying desperately to repress. It was not until the end that I made the connection between Miles and Mr. Quint, though. When Miles dies in the arms of the governess at the end of the book, after confessing that he said things to his fellow classmates that he thought they would like, it appears as if Miles is confessing to being a homosexual. Miles' death could thus be understood as the death of childlike innocence as he admits that he's a sexual being, or it could be literally death, which Victorian readers would have interpreted as punishment for sexual deviance. Keep in mind that the new governess has warded off the advances of Mrs. Jezel, and she's been able to ignore the presence of Quint in the room at the end. The new governess has also sent Flora away as if to prevent any temptation that the child might represent. The sending away of Flora might be an attempt by the governess to protect floor from the deviant influence of Miles and the governess herself who is struggling with her own sexuality. These actions seem to signify then that the governess has fought her own sexual demons that are homosexual in nature and won. While the governess's overwhelming need to protect the children through the novella could be explained as her struggle with her sexuality and the death of Miles could be seen as punishment for homosexual tendencies, it does not mean that James was homophobic. In fact, it is too simple to understand him in modern terms like that. Instead, it's best to leave Victorian literature in its own time and to understand it through its own culture. This means accepting that homosexuality would have been viewed as both a sexual deviance and a mental illness. These understandings are reflected in the treatment of the governess who sees specters that no one else can see and in how she and Miles come unraveled as a result of them. No matter how you read this novella, there is a huge plot hole. The plot hole is the fact that Douglas, the character from the beginning of the story, claims that the unnamed governess was the governess to his sister after her work at Bly. Ask yourself, if a governess came into your home, seemed to lose her mind, withheld vital information concerning the oldest child's education, sent the youngest child to you in the dead of the night, and had the eldest child die in her charge, would you give her a good reference? Governesses of this age relied on good references to move from family to family. Without a reference, it is highly unlikely that the governess would have been able to find a new situation after having a child die in her care. This seems to indicate that the original narrator is actually Miles, who's now going by another name, a.k.a. changing the names to protect the innocent. Just food for thought and yet another avenue for an inspiring researcher and writer that they could possibly make a paper out of. So next week we're getting into the work of Robert Louis Stevenson. He and James were actually friends and they corresponded often. Stevenson even felt so confident in their friendship that he took James to task over the contents of the portrait of a lady. I'll be reading The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde as my main reading goal. I also intend to read The Body Snatcher as a bonus and might even attempt The Suicide Club. Here's a spoiler alert for what's coming down the pike next week. I will be discussing The Ripper Case and The Burke and Hare Murders. As always, a like and a subscribe would be appreciated. I have also left links for free electronic copies of all of my January reading in the description. Until then, have a great week, y'all.